So I got to sit down with Luke from Factory AI. They build Droid and I asked them straight up, where is AI coding actually headed in the next year? Because look, I vibe code every single day, cursor, Claude code, Droid, and I can ship features super fast, but there's no structure there's actually no tests and there's no software organizational quality, if you know what I mean. It's literally just code scattered everywhere. And Luke said something that completely shifted how I'm thinking about this. And I'm excited for you to take a look. He thinks that the next evolution is not actually about more powerful models, but it's centered around an AI that enforces software engineering best practices by default. Stuff like linting, testing, CICD, proper architecture, all that stuff baked in. And then he goes even deeper on model repos becoming a standard, migrations completely changing, and the whole workflow just shifting. And I want to show you what he predicts is coming because if he gets this right, it's actually gonna be a massive shift for the industry on how we ship software and the way that we actually think about AI coding agents for the remainder of this decade. What can enterprises or developers expect out of tools in the next year. And I think the the core thing here is that I would expect, uh, especially using tools like Droid, that the output that you get from these tools resembles that of a software organization a lot more than that of like a vibe coder, right? Nothing against vibe coding. I do it every single day, but you still need to guide the model towards kind of that structure that you want out of your code base. But I expect that to change quite radically um, in, in the next year. I think there's a lot of things that we're doing right now and thinking very actively about, like um, making sure that models are aware of that structure and kind of guide you towards uh, setting up that structure if it's not there uh, originally is is like, I think the way that we'll get there. Um, so things like linting, end-to-end -end testing, unit testing, making sure that you have proper CICD, even for like the smallest of projects, right? Because that's like the, the setup that makes a software project really, really, you know, take off. So I think that's kind of like the outcomes that you can expect, um, as well as just, you know, longer running sessions that are more productive. In terms of building, like as a developer who's building, I think there's some core changes that are going to occur. I think we're going to see a lot more mono repos exist in the wild. And I think mono repo tooling is going to get a lot better. Uh, and so specifically, like why I say that is, it has never been more important for your CI to go green altogether, right? So if, if you can guarantee that, then you know that whatever changes an agent has made are working together in concert, right? If you have a bunch of different repositories, that is more difficult to sort of orchestrate and reach that same outcome. So I think we'll see a lot more mono repos popping up, even for like smaller, smaller time projects. I think it's also never been a better time to learn how software works and to build some yourself, even if you don't have that background. Like, like I was mentioning about changing to match more you know, that of a software organization, I think you're going to see that that benefits folks across the board from someone who's super experienced to someone who's just getting started building software. Um, they'll be able to kind of intuitively learn these patterns uh, by a use of stuff like droids. I think the era of migrations as we know it is a little bit, uh, you know, it, I think it will be changing. I think we see that a lot with even like the, the new release by Cursor, right? Like Cursor has essentially like released a, a 2.0 version of their app where they completely redid their application from like a UI perspective. And naturally that involves lots of backend changes, but they didn't do it from like a migration perspective. They kind of like created a new product on top of it. And then probably, probably will like eventually like replace other things under the hood. But this, this idea of like building a product uh, that is a prototype and then goes straight into like a, a product that you want to release. I, I think that's the new way of thinking about migrations. Like we're actively thinking about how do we want to change our web app to match the capability set of our CLI tool. Um, and I think one of the things that is, stands out is we're actually like building this entire web app from scratch again, because it takes us so little time to do. So in, in you know, a matter of three weeks, we can do the, the amount of work that we did, let's say in a year by using Droid to kind of automate these migrations over. Uh, and so doing so without having users on that product is actually really, really quickly to iterate. 
naturally, once you have users, you want to be a lot slower and a lot more thoughtful about those changes. So I think migrations will change in that sense. I love that thinking because I noticed that for some of my apps too, that I can quickly spin up a better UX or something and then just move over to that super quickly. And there's less of this weight that needs to be carried release to release, right? And yeah. I worked at a company, you know, this fruit company or something that was uh, in the valley for a long time. <laughs> and there's code there from next, you know, step, next OS, like oh, all the way back. You have to, right? There's like all this legacy stuff. The file systems, file systems are like 30 years old plus, right? And working on the iPhone, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, like a certain file system. There's an extreme amount of detail that tends to happen if you're still supporting some of these bigger systems. But like you're saying, sometimes there's a cutoff point where you just say, here on forward, we're going to do this new paradigm. I like that way of thinking. I like the way that you're kind of also thinking about that too for the future of, you know, where, where these types of things are going. You know, even if the models get smarter, these problems still exist because that's what's, I don't know, I feel like the model's almost like the heart that's pumping blood to the rest of the system. But then you also talked about software development lifecycle, which I really do appreciate. That's one of the things I miss as a solar builder is that some of that stability that you get because you can make a change and you know it's going to land at least on the other side of the fence. Either someone's either testing it physically or some type of test is running so that you don't break things too much, especially if you start getting paying customers. And I think the that's my biggest bottleneck too sometimes right now that I'm sort of trying to reproduce. You know, how do I keep track of the agents? I created the simple Kanban documentation folder structure, you know, and and then like there's other things like agentic rules, right? Agents MD files are super important for me because those are like the things I can almost hand off to someone. And, you know, it's like a procedure. It's like, here's the procedures. You should always follow them. They're written down. <laughs> you bring up this word again, like agent scaffolding as like a, a thing that you want to kind of talk more about. One other takeaway that I think I have about just where we're headed um, is I naturally see that like models in that like frontier level, something like, you know, uh, Claude, uh, Opus, or Sonnet, right, are, are feeling really, really good right now at tackling these very comprehensive tasks. You know, you can think of uh, delegating to Droid for like a three to four hour uh, complexity level task. Naturally, now, like the question is, you know, as models get better, does Droid just get more and more capable? I think that's one way of thinking about it. And I think that's definitely true. But there's also this other question of like, do we need those extra extra set of capabilities, or do we need more competitive pricing and you know uh, context management? I think the the latter is actually really really compelling because if you can if you can make like the pricing a lot more approachable for developers, I think you'll see a lot more adoption of these tools. And also, you know, we've been seeing models get better so quickly. I mean, if you think back to where we were like a year ago the 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 change has been kind of like night and day, right? And so I'm really excited about where self-hostable models, open weight models, uh, models that can run on your own machine are headed because I think that actually is the like the next frontier of building on top of models, right? Building agents using those models will be a lot more cost effective. Um, and I'm really excited about that future. So that's where Luke thinks that this is actually headed. An AI that enforces structure by default, mono reapers everywhere, and self-hostable models actually making this affordable. Honestly, as a solo dev, that future is kind of exciting. I'm already sort of trying to build towards this with my own rules, documentation, and all these different workflows. And I'm actually calling this ship smart. And I stream my whole process live of implementing these principles. And if you want to see how I'm testing these predictions, in my real projects, then make sure you go ahead and subscribe. Obviously, slide in through the DMs and drop into the comments. And I'm curious to hear, what do you think about Luke's predictions? Is he completely off? Is this actually going to change the face of coding? To me, it seems very obvious, but to you, would love to hear your opinion. Let's keep cooking.